Hello, and welcome to the third annual Tide Film Festival. My name is Taylor Williams, and I'm the director of Tide, a Brooklyn-based festival that champions racially underrepresented filmmakers. For those of you who don't know Tide, Tide stands for Truth, Intent, Disrupt, and Entitled. The core mission of the festival is to empower filmmakers of color to share their authentic stories and to promote unity and understanding across different cultures and communities. Tide's mission is more crucial now than ever before. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and so many other Black lives that were taken in the past few months have sparked new conversations about race globally. Today, we've gathered a panel of entertainment executives and representatives to have a dialogue about the movement's impact within the industry, why it's taken so long to have these pivotal conversations, and determining where we go from here. Before I turn it over to our moderator, I would like to acknowledge the sponsors that helped make this year's festival possible. HBO, Brooklyn Arts Council, Mazars, and New York City and Company Foundation. I will now hand it off to Wilbur L. Cooper, writer, producer, and host, who will be moderating this conversation about racial justice in Hollywood. Thank you so much, uh, Taylor, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you, panelists, for, for joining. I think this is a really important conversation um, connected with everything that Taylor just said, and I'm super excited to be speaking with all of you about this topic. Before we get into it, could everybody please just introduce themselves and sort of tell us a little bit about what you do? So we'll start with Yes, Greta. I'll start. Um, <laughs> well, hi, my name is Greta Fuentes, and I'm the Director of Development for Film at Macro. Um, we're a production and financier company, and our mandate is to, um, you know, elevate promotion and, um, I don't know, uplifting of people of color in all of our content. So uh, we work in the diversity space, I would say. That's awesome. Hallie? Uh, hey, uh, actually, hey, uh, I'm Haley Mariner. I am an agent in the scripted literary department at APA. Um, yeah, where I work with both writers and directors on the feature and TV side. And Trevor? Hey, I'm Trevor Wall. Uh, I was an executive, uh, production executive at The Mission Entertainment, which is a management production company hybrid focused on um, empowering uh, storytellers and stories from those that have been marginalized and underrepresented. That's awesome. Thank you so much for, for joining this conversation. I think it's, it's super important, obviously, because of the, the recent events that have taken place um, this past summer, as Taylor alluded to, but also just this long history um, that we experience, you know, in this country. Um, we talk about issues of race, uh, diversity. Uh, to begin, I just wanted to kind of lay a bedrock or a foundation down for this discussion and sort of get into what exactly is racial justice? What does that mean? Uh, when you all hear that term? And anyone can answer, whoever feels inspired to jump in. Um, I guess I'll uh, start by saying, I think when I think of racial injustice, or racial justice for that matter, I think the first thing that comes to mind is equality. Um, and that's really kind of what we're fighting for um, on every level, um, just being treated equally, um, when it comes to uh, justice and criminal uh, actions, as well as like in our entertainment uh, in terms of equal representation um, across the board, so. Were there moments um, in your all's career where um, you recognized maybe as a professional that there was a problem, that there was this, as Trevor said, a lack of equality within the entertainment space? Yeah, um, I like for me, I guess it was like the very first glimpse I had when I started in the industry. Um, I started in the mailroom at WME and there was only like one or two other Latinas apart from me. Um, and then like other people of color, like a couple of friends that I had were also black. Um, and this was like not too long ago, honestly, it was 2014 when I started. And so I think that was like my first exposure to the lack of representation in the, the business side of things at, at agencies specifically. Um, and then obviously beyond that, eventually with like the executive ranks, but um, I've had like a night and day 
uh, transition in terms of like being somewhere where I was like one of very few and then being somewhere where it's all people of color really. So um, it's been really nice to see obviously the changes in the past few years, but you know, we're still needing to do a lot of things to really help um, push that further beyond private companies like a macro, you know, where we make it our mandate and it's black owned and um, it needs to be in the studios too and the agencies and other places like that. Um, yeah, so basically I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could tell me an anecdote or a moment in your professional career when you recognize that there was a problem with uh, racial justice within the entertainment industry. Yeah, and so, I mean, growing up, I was is ma mainly being surrounded by a lot of people, uh, a lot of white folks, and then coming into the industry, so it's like you're always surrounded by um, that group, and then I think so always being the minority, it didn't feel like anything was wrong. I think it's when I started coming up at the agency and really kind of learning about, like, who, what do I want to do as an agent? Like, what do I want to become? And I think so from there, kind of, like, everything became more obvious. Um, even in terms of just like, I think some of the microaggressions and stuff like that too. Once you started learning more about just yourself as a black person, at least for me, as self as a black person and a black woman, uh, all those like shattering of the walls kind of fell and you're like, oh wow, like this is what our company looks like. These are the people in the face of our company versus how we've had so many other, like the type of clients we have as well. So I think that was kind of a moment, an aha moment of like, oh, I guess I'm the only one right now doing this uh, at, at, at my company, which feels weird. Um, so yeah. <laughs> was that something, uh, what you guys experienced as professionals, did you have an inkling of that before you came in the industry? You know, like as people who j maybe just consume content and didn't contribute to making it, did you already have an idea that there was an issue or did you come in sort of thinking that, um, maybe there's equal opportunity, equal placement, that kind of thing. I mean, I necessarily didn't feel like there was, um, I mean, when I initially wanted to come into the business, I wanted to be a director and I was like, I'm going to be the first black female to win Academy Award. But I didn't think of it as because there hasn't been anyone prior. It was more so like, I just want to be the first. That's also probably the really competitive part in me. Um, but again, I think so once moving out here, that all became apparent of like, oh, there really hasn't been a lot of equality in terms of people's projects getting made and everything. Cause it's like, you're only, ac you only the access you have is the access that you have. And for me growing up in the Midwest, it's like the movies that were playing in the theaters were those movies I didn't think about. What are all these other movies that I'm not seeing that could have been made or these other filmmakers? Cause it's a very small community there of people who wanted to be filmmakers. Um, so again, I think so for me, it's like once I, not even film schools, like once I came out to LA and started working, that's when I started noticing so much more about the type of content that gets made. Because again, when you're in film schools, like you're just creating the stuff you create. And I don't think too much about it in terms of like, how am I, am I making an impact for the black community? I was like, no, I'm making stuff that I like. <laughs> um, and I think so I always led with that. And so for me, I think so it's a little bit naive when I came into it too, but it became such an obvious answer in such a um kind of just it took you kind of by storm i think once i got here you know it seems like right now we're at a very intense moment but when we look at american history at least you know we see that there are somewhat cycles that happen you know where there are outrage over police violence or racism in the country there are protests and in some ways culture and art sort of responds to it there are a lot of black films um, in the 70s that responded to it. There's a lot of black films in the 90s that responded to it. Um, what do you think about this moment that we're in right now? Is this, how is this similar the, to what we've seen before? And then also, is this different? And how is this different? Trevor, maybe you could jump in. Yeah, I would say, um... It's, yeah, the, the similarities, it's very cyclical, uh, as you saw with like the 70s and the 90s. And now uh, just, I think, uh, inherently sort of history tends to repeat itself in some ways. But I think uh, some major differences, I would say, is now we're starting to see that uh, myth of these type of stories not making money uh, to be just absolutely false. I mean, we're, we're seeing films like Black Panther and Get Out just make incredible amount of profit. 
uh, for these, let's say what they are, uh, white men uh, that are looking for just to make a buck and sort of make profit, uh, that they no longer honestly have an excuse uh, to not green light or produce um, you know, diverse content. Yeah, I don't, I would say on my end, like, it's kind of interesting, right? Because I feel like there's a few films that I've seen from the past that definitely felt like ahead of their time, not even just for black content, but like just diverse content in general. Um, like I know uh, one of the films I saw, I saw like these days that was from back like early 2000s, I think was like, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was Alice, Alice who just did the half of it on Netflix. That's like really great YA. Mm -hmm film her one I think it was like one of her first films that she did was actually a studio movie and I watched it like these days and it was um you know it had this amazing female lead and it just felt so like from this current time in the past so there was like decisions made in the past that greenlit good projects and I don't know if maybe it was just like a weird timing of not enough eyes were on those kinds of things and then because not enough eyes were on them like the the wider industry and like the powers um that approve things like maybe just sign things like that off and didn't approve more beyond that just because i feel like they put so much pressure on like one project to to just answer all multicultural projects like so if one black movie doesn't do great it's like well we probably shouldn't do any others and like don't take all these other factors into account you know um so i think it's it's like a a lot of different things it's more like they Pull, make like an equation and all these things have to kind of like add up and make sure the numbers come out well and like you know box office and all that kind of stuff but um i think some of the these days anyways with like the really exciting projects like black panther and lulu wong's movie and you know crazy rich asians like those projects have just been so amazing and connected with so many different people people who are people of color and not people of color that i think the industry is like a little bit more open to working with diverse content and then like literally now in this moment because of what this country's going through and and everyone's seeing like the injustices against the black community and then just other communities of color i think the industry is like a little bit more um aware of like what they're taking on but i don't know i feel like it's not fully going to change unless there's people of color who are in the senior positions who are heads of studios to like actually enact something for a long time versus just treating it as like a fad in a moment to like say, hey, we serviced this community then, you know what I mean? Like to be able to just check that thing off, right? I don't know, that's how I feel. Yeah, I would, I would add on top of that, that I do think there's also a change of tide now um, about giving these filmmakers second chances. You know, like a lot of times back, or back then, if you made a movie that didn't, uh, you know, wasn't successful that they essentially just never get work again. Um, but you know, now things like uh, Ava DuVernay can make a wrinkle in time that like uh, was less than uh, what Disney was expecting in terms of profit and all of that. Uh, but you know, back back in the '90s or even the '70s, like her career would be over, uh, quite honestly. Um, and it's you know nice to see that like no people people have good ones and bad ones all the time, uh, and that's part of that equality thing that we just want that same equality that white filmmakers make. Mm -hmm. When you are thinking about the content um, that, that is coming out, like how important is it to address the trauma, the struggle, the pain of what's being experienced by, you know, Latino people, Black people, Asian people, et cetera, in this country? And then how also is, it, is there a space for things that ex exist outside of that? How do, you, how do you weigh the two things or do those things always sort of come together? I think it's going back to what Trevor was saying of equality, like we should be able to see ourselves in like a really dope sci-fi or like a super funny comedy or a rom-com. Like we need to like take up space that we haven't seen ourselves in. Um, I think that, you know, period projects, biopics, things like that are most often what is given to us and what's greenlit. And like, there's certainly a space for that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, past histories of ours, but why can't we get you know, thankfully it happened with Black Panther, but like, you know, we need to see more Crazy Rich Asians, more Black Panthers, um, more all kinds of other stuff, you know, like I'm, I'm, uh, I grew up loving Wes Anderson and it's like, why can't I have somebody who does that for my community or just generally all people of color? Like there's, those people are out there. Um, I think you just have to look for them and, you know, give them a shot and 
support them uh, as they're coming up. And so, um, yeah, I think that we should have both. It should be a level playing field. Definitely. And I think, yeah, it's, it's a balance. It's like, I think so again, all of us, again, as marginalized communities, it's like, we're always like, I guess I will just speak more so on the black community, just given that's my background and like the Arab community, but there is this balance that we need to have. Cause again, there's always like, for instance, race is always a part of our conversations for all of us on here. It's like, that's always going to be a part of our conversations, whether or not white people understand that. Um, you, we can't help it in a way. It's just like, because that's how people identify us. They look straight, at, look at us and they're like, oh, you look different than me. And then that's instantly from there. It's like, you understand that. So I think so those projects that do have the trauma, the history, it's like, again, those are important. I think so there's a learning curve for people outside of that division to understand. But at the same time, it's like, we need to, yeah, we, as Greta says, like, I want to see us, ourselves in a fun comedy movie that doesn't have to do with our trauma or have, obviously there's going to be jokes that deal with that, which is always like, okay, something we all relate to, but we'll have to see ourselves in something in a sci-fi movie where you don't really notice that the race is a component um, for once. It's finally just something like, oh, they happen to be a Latina person or oh, they happen to be a black person on screen, but the story is this sci-fi thing about humanity. It doesn't have to actually do with it. I think so that would be a really great change, but I think so yeah, the historical biopics are the ways that we're slowly getting into it. It's like, okay, if you guys can do these movies, now let's try these. It opens up a lot of things in terms of, again, coming back to the people who are running the studios. It's like, they need to be able to take those chances more. Because again, it's like, in the 90s, they took chances on a lot of very terrible movies. Uh, like, you could literally sell stuff. It was just like, you sell stuff off a log line. It's like, you can't do that now. It's like, you have to have all these different levels and you have to have a whole reason of why it has to, has to be neat. Sometimes it's like, hey, I just want something fun with these characters. Like, why can't that be enough sometimes? Um, obviously, trigger in certain circumstances, but it's, it is one where I think so that opens up a bigger conversation in that too. Haley, I wanted to ask you, you know, on the agent side, have you, have you seen the kind of energy or the kind of, you know, change that's been happening um, in terms of di push for diversity and more opportunities for people of color? Um, yes. I mean, I, I see the enthusiasm that people want to bring. Like they really, I think so very much after the George Floyd, like there was these conversations. Everyone was like, we have to do better. It's like, I think so everyone thought they were doing well. Um, but then putting a spotlight from that situation. And I think so they're seeing how their colleagues were reacting to it. They're like, we have to do better um, in it. And so, yes, I see a growth in terms of it. I think so. Do you, I'm see, always more wary. Do you see more agents of color um, being successful and, and sort of breaking new ground within, within the industry behind the scenes? That I would not be able to <laughs> tell you at times. Uh, <laughs> I mean, during this time, I've met a lot more people of color agents that I didn't even know existed at other companies. Um, so it's not like, I think so internally, it's, it's, a, it's a spot where they know that needs to be fixed and needs to be grown. Um, and they've always been aware of that. It's a matter of like, how do we navigate it, especially now with COVID. I think so that came into it um, and fixing that pipeline. But at other companies, I mean, Obviously, I can't speak for them. Um, with in terms of diversifying our clients and reaching out, I think so. There is this big push for it, but my concern and hesitation that always comes with it is, yeah, is this a fad? Is this something where um, people are only doing it just to have those people on their roster and only looking at it as money, not as changing the changing the way we view content, not and like changing the scope. That's the part that I hesitate a little bit with. Um, I've noticed sometimes, and I don't know, like Greta and Trevor with this too, it's like the whole, um, the one drop rule that came obviously when you're like, if you have one drop of black, it's like you're considered black. I feel like there's this reverse version of it now where it's like, if somebody is like a fraction of 
person of color in some sort of way. If they're one eighth Native American, people are like, they're diverse. And, that's, and like that part irritates me so much because I, again, I think so the word diverse opens up so much. It's like, there's a lot of different versions of diversity, um, obviously in identity and then obviously in racial and ethnicity um, and also nationality and also um, social status. And I think so there is that effort where people are trying to push to really look at content and try to put people of color first for a, a moment. But I feel like sometimes they, then they overdo it where they're like, well, this person is uh, one eighth of this. So that's mean they're diverse, which means we can give them a job and like trying to fix, like beat the system with the stuff that they already have rather than like, how do I actually, actually, like actually like look at my roster, see the changes I need to implement uh, and really do that. And I think so people have to look at that as a company too, where it's not just like, oh, this person has an ethnic last name. That's mean we have that quota, uh, which I don't think necessarily my company does that at all. But I think so it's a mindset that you can't help but think of if people are doing that. Um, to kind of um, go around it at times. Uh, Greta, you know, when you are doing your job, how do you figure out what companies to, and what platforms to place the content that is being made by your company? Like, how do you, what, and how do you know what feels right and what's like the appropriate partner to, to put out the project? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we approach all the traditional studios and streamers and festivals and all of that. Um, I think in terms of like partnering with people maybe to like produce things with us or co-finance things, it always boils down to the fact that they understand the content and respect um, that it should be authentic. And so I think we've been lucky enough to identify people again, also at like the studios or streamers that are somebody from maybe that specific community or just are a person of color that can understand um, how a project needs to get made in the right way. And so I think we're always just really mindful of that, but we approach all of those conversations like head on first. So for example, maybe it's like, we really need this director to be a person of color and they need to be from like this community to tell this story. And that's something that we're like super upfront about if it's maybe a project that we're taking to set up at a studio and there isn't a director yet. Um, and those are conversations that you have, right, obviously prior to be able to get on the same page and hopefully set up whatever project that is. And I'd say across the board between like film and TV, that's something that that we do with a distributor or just producing partner or co-financier. Um, but yeah, just conversations that, that you have up front to make sure everyone aligns. And Trevor, when you are, looking at the ch change and shift that's happening in the industry. Um, and obviously people are calling for more people of color. How can we exist within those spaces, but at the same time also avoid sort of the, the tokenism uh, that I think Haley kind of touched on a little bit, you know, this idea of being in these, in these spaces. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a, um, a funny little anecdote that I'll share in relation to that. Um, I was interviewing at a company, uh, after um, the George Floyd murder and all of that, uh, that, un, un, uh, you know, without saying their name, they were an all white uh, company, had no uh, person of color on their staff. And from what I heard, they were actively sort of interviewing and looking for someone of color because they saw this problem with all the sort of civil unrest wanting to address it. So I straight up asked them, you know, uh, since I will be the only person of color, presumably at your company, uh, what are the ways in which you are going to empower me and uplift me, um, as opposed to just, uh, checking me off as a box, uh, so your company is not all white. Um, and I think that's really the heart of what, uh, what's needed and what separates actual change and instead of just tokenism, uh, is ways of empowering and uplifting people, uh, on, on my side and also on the creative side with writers as well. Um, hiring them as just writers assistants or staff writers is just not, it's just not enough. Um, you need to actually really empower them and uplift them and not just have them take up space in a chair so that you can say that your writer's room wasn't all white. So. There's, it feels like there's a great amount of um, pressure that comes with sort of being that only person of color in the room. And then also a great deal of extra amount of work because you know, as a journalist, for instance, you know, when something like the 
George Floyd situation happens, you know, if you're in an all white newsroom, everybody's looking to the person of color in the newsroom to be able to articulate or contextualize or do that. And it, and it, it can um, kind of be confining and in a box. And not, I, um, that's just an idea, but I love it to hear from Greta and Haley, like what are the thoughts you have about this, this feeling or this experience in your respective spaces where um, you might be that only person um, how do you deal with those extra added pressures that come that may be not fully recognized by the people around you? Oh. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, I mean, first, I would have to say I definitely, during this time, I think I had to just kind of step back on myself and just be like, you can't be apologetic for who you are. I think so. There was always this nerve and this kind of just like moment of stepping back of like, if I ever have an opinion stuff, I don't want to be looked at as the angry black woman or the sassy black mo woman, um, which I have been called before. And it sucks because I always thought sassy meant fun. And when people use it towards you, you don't realize they're using it in a demeaning way. So it was one, I think so at this point, I kind of just like have to unapologetically like not hold back. It's like, this is how I feel. And like, I'm going to just be very honest with it. And like, maybe sometimes it won't come out as uh, poised as I want it to be. And I will just kind of filter it in that moment. It's like, Hey, you know what? This is not going to come out as well as like as nicely as you need it to, to come out. But this is how I'm feeling at the moment. This is how this is. Um, so I think so trying to do that more, just, I think so not knowing that you're not speaking for a whole community, you're just going to be speaking for yourself and you have to just understand that. I think so there's so much pressure that I even hold where I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm doing this diversity inclusion meeting. I'm speaking for all brown and black people uh, and who wanna become agents that I don't know who exist. And I have to realize like, that's not, you can't put that pressure on yourself. It's like, there's already enough pressure in our jobs that we have um, that we need to just know it's like, you know what, it's, it's still gonna take time. It's gonna be a step at a time, but let's focus here. Like, let's try to do this. This is the things that you, and the grievances that you have right now that we need to fix. So I think so it's very much just trying to come from an honest place and not holding back um, and realizing that we're not always gonna be like, not, not always gonna have the right answers too. And I, th that should be okay. Like, I think so people always think we will, but it's like, nah, it's like, we're still learning about ourselves. We're still continuing to grow. Like, especially with the three of us, like we're all up and coming into this business as executives. And so like, we're still learning and managing the ways we wanna to continue to do our business. And so people shouldn't hold us to a certain level um, in terms of like, they have to have this opinion right now. Like I think so always be uplifting us and making sure the environment that we're giving our opinions that are safe and people are not gonna use that to attack us later on saying, oh yeah, you said this, blah, blah, blah. Like I think so if someone comes back around to do that, that's just gonna become a dangerous environment. I think looking at the bright side of that, um, I, I don't honestly don't experience that as much, obviously working at like a diverse company, thankfully, but um, just thinking like putting myself in somebody else's shoes, if I'm like in a diversity committee or something like that, I think we're empowered in those moments to say, I only can speak to like this certain level about communities of color, but if I'm not black or I'm not whatever, the other ethnicity is like we should probably consider bringing out somebody on from that community or have them as a consultant or hire them as a writer or director on something and so i think that we're empowered in that way to like open doors for other people and make sure that things are handled in the best way possible in terms of like respecting whatever community that is um or even just like maybe we should reach out to our friends who are at this company or do this kind of stuff um, or do racial justice kind of work. Like there's so many different ways that you can approach something that um, is smart for whatever situation you're in, you know, as a, as a company or as an executive. So um, yeah, I think it's tough to, to be treated as like the token whatever person and have to answer for all communities of color. But I think, again, it's like being up front at the top. Like I can only answer to a certain extent. Um, if we really wanna do, do the actual work, then we should bring in these people and include them in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Trevor, can you tell me what you think are some of the types of content that networks are looking to buy right now and how that sort of fits into um, this broader racial justice conversation that we're having? 
Oh, man. Um, I don't know if it necessarily fits into the broader racial justice, um, but there's still like a heavy, heavy uh, emphasis on IP. Um, and, you know, when you think of, when we mentioned Black Panther, when we mentioned Crazy Rich Asians, like those are based off of uh, pre-existing IP. So that's kind of really, I think, first and foremost in a lot of people's minds. But what's exciting is you're seeing uh, a new interest in, uh, you know, non-white IP, uh, like, you know, Lovecraft Country, all different kinds of things that are coming out uh, that can be, you know, based off IP, but are don't necessarily have to be uh, white stories. And Greta, I was wondering if you could talk, I know you, um, you know, worked in the mailroom at WME and, um, you know, you worked with Charles King, like how important is it to have uh, mentors or people who you can like look up to, who you see within the industry, who can be sort of a guiding light for you to take yourself to the next level and for you to also see yourself in the next level? I think it's incredibly important. Um, you know, for me, I got lucky enough that I was able to meet Charles at WME, but even before, I didn't even really fully know Charles. Um, Mark Inkner took me under his wing and he was an amazing kind of mentor figure for me and was some who was, who was an ally, um, who's somebody who's white and was working in one of the few people working in the diversity space and just really understood that content and was close to Charles. And so when the opportunity came up for me to, to interview, to be his assistant, um, you know, I had his support and recommendation uh, to be hired for that position. And I did. And then I think that was even extended even further, just in my, um, you know, relationship with Charles also as like a mentor and him seeing me as a person of color and respecting my passion for the Latino community as a Latina and wanting to work on that kind of content for macro and really empowered me to find those kinds of projects. Um, empowered me to, to first learn how to do things on the business side, helping him out, then learn on the creative side, being an assistant uh, in development and then eventually be promoted to creative executive and director of development. And now, you know, I am able to like pick my slate and build that. Um, and we have that kind of mutual trust and so it's been invaluable. You know, I think it makes all the difference. Um, I think it's a big reason why Macro has some really exciting projects because we're all the executives are trusted to to really find excellent things that um, you know really help uplift all communities of color. And so I can't say enough about really finding somebody who who could be a mentor and really help you and open doors. And I think it also falls on us uh, to help you know folks that are also coming up as well. That's awesome. Greta, you know, you mentioned um, this idea of allies. I was wondering if, and this is for everybody, uh, Trevor and Haley, you know, like how important is it to have those allies and, and what role does that play in this mission of racial justice that we're talking about? Oh, it's huge. I mean, uh, especially with green lighting projects. I mean, to, be, to put it bluntly, white people still control that for the most part. Um, they control whether something is going to get green light or whether something is going to get money. So having those allies uh, to be able to sort of, yeah, take those chances uh, and to believe and trust and invest in non-white storytellers is huge. You know, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about um, Atlanta recently uh, and thinking about going back and rewatching it, mostly because I just missed that show. It's great. But thinking about how incredible the level of sort of trust uh, that FX put into Donald Glover. When you think about the black TV landscape back then, like it was either black sitcoms or black melodramas like Empire, something that was just surreal and weird and different, a half hour that's not all laughs. Uh, you know, it took a, it took a big risk uh, for, X, for FX and it obviously paid out well for them. Um, but it's, yeah, it, you need sort of allies like that that are willing to sort of take those chances um, that they, honestly, they give those chances to white filmmakers. They do it all the time. Uh, so it's just, again, going back to that equality thing, just giving that same, same equality treatment uh, to non-white filmmakers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's giving those, uh, those equal opportunities. And I mean, to go off on more so on the representation side, I think what's been great, like, I've had my colleagues in the lit department, um, I'll say shout out to Adam Perry, <laughs> who was my boss in the lit side, um, was extremely just a huge advocate for me. I think so, I mean, I think so he saw 
in me before I realized that I could be an agent. Um, but he, he made the effort of like saying, Hey, stop by my office, come and read scripts, like showing me ways. And when I started working for him, really making it feel like I, we were part of a team. It wasn't, you work for me. You just do all my stuff. It was like, Hey, no, I want your opinion on this. What do you think about this? We're taking this out. What do you think? And like really making it a learning process that I don't feel like all higher ups do with their um, assistants or anyone who are, who are below them, where it's like giving them the opportunity to really learn and hold on to it. It's like, I mean, I, I feel like I thank him so much for all those opportunities. And obviously a lot of my other colleagues in the departments do the same exact thing now, especially now it's like, as for me, it's like, again, coming from more of the feature side, but being able to now work in TV, it's like, I have some of my TVs and uh, colleagues in television are like, hey, come join this meeting. Hey, you want to talk about this contract? Let's talk about how this gets broken down and really trying to become a mentor, become that teacher that we all need. It's like, we don't have that pipeline. It's like, if you don't know what the job is um, and you don't know how, how to do it and like no one's there to really want to teach you, they're just saying, okay, you're just going to schedule and answer phones for me without saying like, do you know why I'm doing this? Hey, do you want to try this with me? Um, you're not really going to have those stepping stones to do well. And I think so having someone who's done that for myself and being that ally has made me stronger. I mean, I'm also super competitive. So I'm all about, that. <laughs> again, <laughs> going back to that, I'm very competitive in terms of like wanting to lo- uh, grow and learn. Um, and I try to, I think so. I just try to follow that same lead too, especially when I meet other people of color who are interested in coming to the agency, maybe not initially thinking that they could be an agent, but showing them, hey, these are all the really cool things you can do as an agent. It's not just um, being this hardcore person who doesn't care, like who's only there to only make money. It's like, no, we're here to also elevate voices to really like we're we're there to help change the landscape. Hopefully, like we want to be able to create more shows like Atlanta and Lovecraft Country and be able to advocate. At least that's the goal I have in mind. It's like I would love to have shows like that that would change the landscape where then you meet more filmmakers who are like, oh, I can do something kind of weird and quirky and left of center. And it doesn't have to yet be this melodrama, like exploitation film or something like that. Definitely. And this is uh, for, this is the last one before we switch to the uh, audience Q and A, but this is for Greta and then anybody else that wants to pick, pick up on it. But, you know, Trevor and Haley mentioned like Atlanta and some other shows. I was wondering from you in a, in a development position, like who are the creators right now who you think are sort of leading the charge and creating content or also working behind the scenes um, who are helping us reach that goal of, of racial justice? Um, you know, who are the people that you think are, are going to be the next wave that we should be looking out for? Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people, obviously, I feel like there's a lot of big names everyone knows, but it's like, I mean, obviously, Ava DuVernay is doing so many amazing things through her company and just how she's been able to be, uh, you know, use her star power and her um, her relationship with studios and things like that. I think today I saw that um, she's doing a Native American show. Uh, which is incredible because we really need more representation on that side but you know figures like that people like Lulu Wong opening doors um, Barry Jenkins obviously I think there's a lot of new exciting voices to all these people that are like staff writers on shows like Lovecraft and Atlanta and um, so I think it's I think it's an exciting time for baby writers too Um, you know we we work with a writer who actually started in the mail room with me, um, who's a really dear friend of mine. His name's Neil Pike, who's Indian American. And um, throughout throughout COVID, we were able to set up his short sci-fi short story uh, for development over at Warner Brothers. Um, so you know things like that. People are just I think are more open to to working with new and upcoming voices if they have really fresh and exciting ideas. I think people like that look out for the Neil Pikes of the world. Look out for um all these up, other up-and-comers and people that are in places that we don't necessarily traditionally consider um places we get new ideas from you know so not from agencies or uh studios but like on TikTok, who care like and you know like on instagram or um there's so many different kinds of creative minds out there that are just working on such excellent content and and they could also be a photographer who's making a transition into um being a director and that kind of stuff so I would say, yeah, there's so many names out there of just people who are working on great stuff. Um, and it just feels like a good time taking advantage of what's going on with the country and studios and companies being a bit more open to 
entertaining those kinds of pieces of content, um, I think we're going to definitely see the effect of that, hopefully in the next couple of years. Yeah, I think uh, just another name I would throw in and add on top of that um, is Alana Mayo, who like just um, was named uh, the head of a, a, of a studio, Orion, which is like unheard of one uh, that a black woman is going to be running a studio and actually uh, giving the green light to projects. Uh, but I, I really look forward to seeing what her and her team uh, put out and in terms of just great non-white stories. Up next, we're going to do some questions from the audience. I've got a question here from Kyle Kords, who is from the Orphanage Collective. Kyle asks, there is a constant issue of diversity across the different creative ranks in a room and are often stacked in the entry level positions that really get promoted. How do we ensure that we are creating places of growth and not just optics for the hegemony? And anybody can jump in. I think this, this definitely yeah. builds off of a lot of the things that we've been talking about before. Yeah, I mean, I think so, at least from my side, uh, as a rep, it's, in a way, it's like you kind of have to force, I, as I would like to say, it's like you kind of have to force people like in these executives and hold them accountable. Um, like I, I enjoy how you see right now, like for instance, like CBS was saying, um, how they're going to try to put a certain amount of shows, like percentage, or like these are the percentage of people who are going to be in a room. And that's great. That's a tangible thing we can work towards. But I think so it's like having even more details, like you have to have this percentage amount at this level and this amount of people at this level. I think so by holding people accountable to an actual number um, in that way or pushing them towards that, I think could be very helpful in terms of just numbers, not just, okay, we have to have 40% of people um, from different identity uh, that are identity diversity or um, racial uh, diversity, but it's like, no, not just at a staff level, but as uh, as a mid-level, as an upper level, it's like they, you have to have a certain amount at each level. I think so by holding that, I feel like that could be a way to hold people accountable and really see the change um, in terms of optics. Um, but I think so that's also going to have to, in a way, it's going to kind of have to force people to promote people of color a little bit sooner than they would normally do. I think so they would give them a certain amount of years and it's like, okay, now you're ready for that next step. It's like you kind of have to fast track them, give them all the tools that they're ready to learn, fast track them, get the pipeline not so bottled up um, at the bottom and like let that grow. And as it's growing and then after that, it can start evening out again where then you have this process how it goes. But at least that's where I see it. Yeah, I would also, I would say, uh, I think there's two different tracks uh, to that answer. So there's like a financial one and a mentality one. So on the financial side, you first you have to show, show that um, an inclusive writer's room equals a better show, like just better quality. Um, and then once you sort of prove that, that better quality has got to also equal more financial revenue and gain, because that's honestly what all these people are really looking for at the end of the day, uh, is looking to just make money. So, but the downside to that, if focusing strictly on that, is then you run into a bit of that sort of tokenism that we talked about. So the real honest fix, uh, which is obviously the most difficult, of course, uh, is the mentality aspect, is actually sort of changing people's sort of mentality and opinion about these things, um, you know, and, and actually having them believe that it matters versus just doing it because it's financially beneficial or because they're mandated and have to. I think the very first thing at you as a person is like, work as incredibly hard as you can be undeniable so that when you go and ask for a promotion, uh, no one can tell you you don't deserve it, right? Because I think it's easy for people to also get caught up in like, well, just because like this whole thing is going on with hiring people of color and putting a focus on that, you never want to get caught up in like thinking, having somebody think that you're leaning on that to be promoted. I think it's like equip yourself by just being like really good at what you do and make yourself the only person that can do that. And then on top of that, like present all the, those like diversity studies that UCLA and USC does. And the, again, it's on everyone too, to, to mount that pressure on studios and um, agencies and production companies to, to really have their teams reflect, you know, the US and communities of color. Um, Cause things need to be, you know, developed and created in a way that reflects authentic perspectives. And so I think it's like equipping yourself with all those different tools for battle 
to go in and do that. And then the other part of it too, I would say is like, if there is a person who's a person of color, at least even if just one at your company, it's like also having their support too, right? So, um, you know, I think it's creating a relationship with whoever that is and, um, you know, making sure they know what your vision is and, and hopefully getting them on board to support you as well and, you know, put in a good work for you. Thank you guys so much. This next one comes from Kyle Bowles in Inglewood, California. Kyle asks, how do you feel about our industry's response to crimes against Black Americans and the work of the Black Lives Matter movement this year? So this is another big kind of question that touches on some of the stuff that we're, we're talking about, but you know, it's open to anybody to, to answer. I mean, in response to directly the sort of Black Lives Matter movement this year, um, it's going to take time, right? Like, like these things take uh, time to actually like get written and then get made and sort of actually change. Um, I would say one thing that I'm really hoping uh, changes and I think is now uh, a conversation that wasn't before is the way uh, we glorify and uh, make uh, police officers into heroes, uh, especially when they're doing essentially, you know, illegal activity, um, like, you know, uh, interrogation and torture and things like that. Um, you know, I think uh, something, those kind of changes in those conversations at the very least are happening now, which is important and great. Uh, it's only just now time will tell to see, you know, if those, if those stories um, are still getting made or if there are changes being made. I think that's also, I agree. I think it's a big change. Um, this one is coming from Gary Harris in Atlanta, Georgia. Gary asks, Hollywood racial justice con conversations can often fail to include the intersection of queer and trans identities. Black trans folks are experiencing violence at alarming and disproportionate rates and research points to the lack of emphatic and authentic media representation of transgender people as critical causation. Will you commit to increasing representation of trans people of color in your content, both in front and behind the camera? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, a lot of the work that uh, I've done is for Lena Waithe, uh, who is um, an amazing black queer woman uh, that really puts that front and center in a lot of her stories. Uh, worked on her show 20s, uh, BET, which uh, I think was the, was the first show to feature uh, a, bl a black lesbian uh, that's masculine presenting, uh, which is really exciting. Um, so I think, yeah, that's incredibly important and huge, particularly in our community where historically we uh, haven't been the most kind uh, to the LGBTQ community. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely important now uh, more than ever. And I, for one, am very much going to be committed to that. Agreed. <laughs> I'm with Greta and Heather on that, like 100%. Um, we'll love to have more queer and trans and black trans writers and directors, I think. So having them being able to represent themselves and not having other people try to speak for them. Because again, it's like, it's an experience that none of us on here could ever explain or tell in any way. So I think so that's just extremely important and would love to continue to champion those voices. Like anyone was going to say no. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> was testing us. <laughs> <laughs> the last one comes from Gregory Shea, who's from Milton, Massachusetts. Gregory asks, in your opinion, what are the steps the industry needs to take to break down the racial barrier in order to get a fair chance in Hollywood? Who would be the best person to lead this charge to voice these inequities we face and to whom? Ooh. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a loaded one. I mean, it's definitely, we need to hold accountable the, the execs who have the power, um, but not only them, but we also need to hold accountable to the creatives who are being put on projects where it doesn't make sense that they should be directing. It's kind of like the inclusion writer um, kind of mandate that uh, Michael B. Jordan had discussed, uh, which I think is great. And obviously it works um, where the actors who have the power, um, which there, I feel like there's, there's a good handful of them that do. It's like, they really need to hold themselves accountable and say, I'm going to do this. Like, even though it could 
create and shake up stuff that may rub some people the wrong way. It's like, that's the only way for us to really continue to move forward. Um, and I do like that even with some clients I've seen where projects will come in and they'll read it and they're like, Hey, I love this so much, but you know what? I'm not the person who should be telling the story. Like, yeah, obviously it's like they have the writing capabilities to write a great story for it, but they know that they're not the right voice for it. It's like, to accept that, to understand that, it's like, great. Like that just holds you in more respect for anything. Cause then people are like, oh no, you genuinely care about making sure the voice is correct and that it's being said in a, in a way where it's not going to be demeaned in any uh, capacity. So it's definitely holding those people accountable. And then the, the actors who have that power and those big directors, like the Spielbergs and the JJ Abrams, like they need to call out. Cause I think so one thing I've just noticed and now I feel like I'm going on a little tangent is where a lot of the studio execs are like, oh, we are looking for this director and they name Scorsese. They're like, we're looking for a Scorsese. And I was like, well, how about this person of color who has the ability to be the next Scorsese because they have the type of style and the passion for it, but not even being able to have them in the room. And if it kind of defeats the purpose, like bring them into the room, let them at least take that shot in terms of pitching it, um, meet with them, like take, cause you never know where those opportunities come. Cause some of them again could be the lightning in the bottle where they could be the perfect person and it kicks off their career. And now you have the next Scorsese. Um, so I think, so there's, there's a couple ways to really go about it. Um, to answer the question on sort of who should lead us uh, to this promised land. Uh, I a hundred percent think it should be Greta Fuentes. Of course. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I honestly, my, my thing is uh, it shouldn't be on one person. You know, this is uh, a collective and it's, all of us coming together and really making that difference. You know, uh, Haley mentioned J.J. Uh, Abrams, like he hired Vic Mahoney as her, as his second AD on the last Star Wars movie, which is huge. You have people uh, like Jordan Peele uh, bringing up Misha Green for Lovecraft, uh, Ava doing all of her work with Array and all these different uh, storytellers from all across the globe uh, getting uplifted and promoted. So it takes, it takes a village, it takes all of us really put in the work uh, and to rise the tide. Yeah, I totally agree with Trevor about it being a community effort. Not, not, not you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in the community. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for all of your insight and having a really honest and open conversation about an issue that is super, super important. Um, to our industry and also just to our lives. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Taylor is gonna jump back in and give us some closing remarks to our discussion, but I really thank you all for, for sharing and dropping some knowledge. It was great to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone again. Um, I'm so happy that you guys were part of this conversation, like truly from the bottom of my heart. It was so amazing um, to hear you guys speak on this because I've really been looking forward to hearing you guys talk about this and get your insider knowledge. Um, you all touched on so many integral parts of this movement and how we can act change in the media and in society. And so on behalf of all of Tide Film Festival, thank you so much for graciously making the time to join this panel, um, but also for all the other actionable things you've done to advance the movement. As you've all kind of spoke about um, throughout this conversation, there's a lot of change that needs to happen and it's obviously not going to occur overnight. Everyone has a responsibility to society and to themselves to kind of self-educate, listen to new voices, and as Greta said, open doors for others. And as all, you all said, kind of really work towards allyship and hold each other accountable in the plight to achieving true equality. So thank you again to all of you for participating in this dialogue and special thank you to Wilbert for piloting it. Before we go, I want to go ahead and remind our audience that we have additional panels available to stream this weekend. We also have a phenomenal selection of feature film and short screenings, which you can purchase tickets to um, on Tide's website at tidefilmfestival.org. Thank you for listening to this critical conversation and happy watching. <laughs>